talking with someone who was studying for their extra-class license, and they were really confused about this whole issue of bandwidth. Well, no wonder. I don't think the subject is one that comes easily for anyone, and the mathematics involved are pretty daunting, to say the least. Let's look at this without jumping into the deep end of the calculus pool. When we generate a radio signal, any radio signal, we start with a pure radio frequency carrier. It's like just one long, continuous tone. To send some information on that carrier, we must change it in some systematic way to add our information to it. That process of making those changes to the carrier is called modulating the signal. In ham radio, we think of four fundamental ways of modulating a signal, four characteristics of the carrier that we can change in order to transmit information. The simplest is just to switch the carrier off and on in some pattern that the sender and the receiver both understand, such as the Morse code. That's the crudest form of amplitude modulation, what we call CW for continuous wave. Now, we can get a little more sophisticated, and rather than switching the power of the transmitter from off to on and back to off, we can vary it continuously between 0% and 100%, controlling that power electronically so that it takes on the shape we want it to take. That's what we usually think of as amplitude modulation, or AM. We can also leave the power of the transmitter at 100%, but change the frequency of the carrier to transmit our information. That's frequency modulation, or FM. Or we can use FM's cousin, phase modulation, where we change the positive and negative swings of the carrier in some way to transmit our information. Now, there are all sorts of variations on amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation, but they all depend on changing one of those dimensions of the original carrier wave. Now, the faster we can change the characteristics of the carrier, the more information we can send in a given amount of time. Now, here's where bandwidth comes in. I think that if you understand that frequency modulation works by pushing the carrier frequency lower for negative peaks in the modulating signal and higher for positive peaks, then it makes sense that an FM signal would have a particular bandwidth. It would be the difference in hertz between the lowest frequency and the highest frequency of the carrier. But what about AM? Why does it have bandwidth? Well, each time we change that carrier, we're mixing another frequency with the original carrier frequency. When any two frequencies mix, and this is the key to the whole thing, when any two frequencies mix, that mix creates additional frequencies. The frequencies we end up with are the original frequencies plus the sum of frequency 1 and frequency 2, and the difference of frequency 1 and frequency 2. Now, anybody who's ever tuned a guitar by ear, and I realize that's a dying art because everybody has these little electronic tuners, but if you've ever done that by ear and matched the pitch of two strings, you know the way you did it is by listening for a little beat tone. What it sounds like is the two strings are canceling out, and so you get this sort of wah, 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 wah sound of the two strings. And what that sound is, is the difference in frequency between the two strings. So if they are off by one hertz, one cycle per second, then you'll hear one beat per second because that's the difference between those two frequencies. Now, if we modulate a 147 megahertz carrier, 147 million cycles per second, with a 3,000 hertz tone, a 3 kilohertz tone, that's right in the audio range, we end up with two frequencies, 
One is at 147 million and 3,000 hertz, and the other is at 146,997,000 hertz. Plus, we still have the two originals. If we modulate a carrier with a human voice, we end up creating a whole bunch of frequencies. Here's a snapshot of a spectrum analyzer readout of my voice saying, ham radio is great. On this spectrum analysis graph, frequency reads from left to right on the x-axis, and amplitude reads low to high on the y-axis. Now You can see there's energy all the way from 0 hertz up to 10,000 hertz. Now, if we modulate a carrier with that, we'll create a bunch of frequencies, up and down from the center frequency, and end up with a signal that looks something like this on the spectrum. Since those frequencies go up to 10,000 hertz, the bandwidth of the signal would end up being twice that, or 20,000 hertz. The higher the frequency we send, the more that bandwidth expands. If we think in digital terms, the more bits we send, the more the bandwidth expands, because more offs and ons, in the same amount of time, is just a higher frequency of modulation. Now what about a Morse code CW signal? Does it have bandwidth? Well, yeah, it does. Not much, but definitely some. In theory, that Morse code DIT or DAW is a perfect square wave. It has a leading edge that goes straight up, and then it goes perfectly flat, and then straight back down. Well, if that was really how things are, that dit would have infinite bandwidth, because the frequency indicated by a vertical line on an amplitude versus time graph is an infinite frequency. It's instantaneous. Well, here in reality, there's no such thing as a perfect square wave because going from 0% to 100% in zero time would require an infinite amount of energy. In practice, the leading and trailing edges of that dit are sloped enough to end up giving us a bandwidth of, say, 50 to 150 hertz, depending on how fast the operator is closing the contacts on that Morse code key and how fast they're sending. There's a fundamental physics theorem that covers this. It's called the bandwidth theorem, and it says the bandwidth, what physicists call the delta omega of a given impulse, goes up as the impulse gets shorter. So let's take a look at this on software-defined radio. What you're looking at here is a software-defined radio, or the output of a software-defined radio, and it's up on the web. You can find all kinds of these if you go to websdr.org. This one happens to be based in Half Moon Bay, California. It's the KFS web SDR. It's run by W6DRZ. So thank you, Craig, for putting this up. So what I have tuned in here, I've got the 40 meter voice band up, and you're looking at frequency going across this way, and then time is kind of marching on this way. So as signals occur, you see what, how they're spread across the band, and then they just kind of march off into infinity there. Now, what I have tuned in right now is a Russian shortwave AM station. And you can hear it's you know, not great reception today, but it's, uh, it's coming in, and we can tell it's a Russian station. And what I want you to look at is how that signal spreads across the band. So right here is the center frequency, 
And we've got this filter, this is the filter right here, showing the bandwidth that we're listening to, and that's set at about 9 kilohertz right now. And you can see that uh, Mr. Russia is very ambitious <laughs> with his modulation, and he's, he's covering well more than, uh, than 10 kilohertz with his signal. That's the carrier right there in the center, and then these are the sidebands coming off to the side. Now, just up the band, we have something that looks really different. It's a lot narrower, and uh, it's actually all going in one direction. We'll move up there and listen. And uh, what do we what do we hear? Boy, that sounds weird, doesn't it? That is single sideband. And so we'll switch the radio down here to uh, this is the 40 meter band, so we'll be going to the lower sideband. Now you can see this little line right here indicates the center frequency that we're listening to. We'll tune these guys in for just a second here. Let's zoom in a bit too. You can hear it changing pitch as I kind of zero in on the what would have been the carrier frequency if the carrier wasn't gone. So now look, here's our center frequency, and this lower sideband signal is extending down the band, but not much up. Filter's not working perfectly there, so a little bit's leaking out on the upper side, but not a big deal. Um, now here's somebody talking back with a weaker signal, but still covering about the same amount of bandwidth. And now, if you look down here, our bandwidth is 3.26 kilohertz, so it got a whole lot narrower. Okay, now let's go see if we can take a look at the CW section of the 40 meter band. I've switched it over. It takes a moment to kind of find the signal and build that waterfall display. That's what this is called, is a waterfall display. So let's switch this over to CW. You notice it got a lot narrower. See, here's lower sideband, and here's CW. Now the 40 meter CW band is pretty quiet at the moment. Let's try 20. There we go. I'm zoomed in all the way. This filter now, this distance from here to here, is only about one kilohertz right now. It's a pretty steep filter. And you can see that's barely even showing up, even at full zoom. I'm zoomed in as far as I can go. I'll show you where we were zoomed before. When we were listening to voice, we were back about here. So you can see how skinny that CW signal is, but it still has some bandwidth. So anytime you push that press to talk button and start transmitting, you're occupying more spectrum than that frequency readout on your radio might suggest. As hams, we need to be aware of that so we don't inadvertently send signals outside of our assigned ham frequencies, which can happen when we're transmitting on a frequency near the lower or upper edge of a band. Okay, well, subscribe to the channel because we're always adding new videos, and if you have stuff you want to see a video about, by all means, drop me a line at af7kb at fasttrackham.com. Uh, take a look at the website, check us out on Facebook, and yeah, that's probably enough tasks for you today. See you later. 7-3, AF7KB clear.